Good morning. Uh, good morning and welcome to the thematic track session on the future of petrochemicals. I'm Siddharth Singh, the lead country analyst and coordinator for the International Energy Agency based in New Delhi. For years, the World Sustainable Development Summit by Terry has been the most important sustainability event in India, helping setting the agenda and elevating the discourse. The IEA is proud to be associated with the WSDS this year for the discussion on the, the, on the sustainable future of the petrochemicals industry in India and around the world. Uh, IEA's research shows that petrochemicals are becoming the largest drivers of global oil demand ahead of cars, airplanes, and trucks. This trend is going to accelerate as we move on from 2030s to 2050. Uh, as most of you here would be aware, petrochemicals are you know, components derived from oil and gas which are used in all sorts of daily products. Uh, this includes plastics, fertilizers, packaging, clothing, digital services, detergents, tires, the flex banner behind us. So it's important for us to understand you know, where the future of this industry is headed. Uh, this in particular presents a challenge in terms of the energy transitions towards cleaner fuels. It also contributes to greenhouse gas emissions from the sector and presents other environmental concerns such as the pollution of oceans with plastic waste. So this session will take a deep dive into the petrochemical sector globally and in India. It will investigate the future demand trends of, for petrochemicals and their implications for the energy system, as well as for the avenues of meeting growing demand while helping achieve the UN sustainability goals. This uh, thematic uh, track session will include a keynote address by our honorable guest, uh, Mr. Raghavendra Rao, who is a secretary in the Department of uh, Chemicals and Petrochemicals in the Ministry of Chemicals and Fertilizers. This will be followed by a presentation by the IEA and a panel discussion. To get things going, I'd first uh, request uh, our chief guest, uh, Secretary Rao, as well as uh, Dr. Jay Mathur, Director General of Terry, and Peter to take stage, Peter Levy from the IEA. Um, Dr. Ajay Mathur is the Director General of Terry and a member of the Prime Minister's Council on Climate Change. In the past, uh, he's also held the Director Generalship of BE, sorry, uh, and uh, which is very relevant to what uh, we're going to talk about today. And uh, I'd request him to uh, get the things going today. Thanks. Thanks, Siddharth. Mr. Raghavendra Rao, Mr. Levi, friends. Uh, it's good that we are here today talking about the future of the petrochemicals sector. It's amazingly important and in fact one of the areas which is at the intersection of development as we see it, Siddharth just talked about how petrochemicals has entered into our lives in almost everything that we do and in fact there is a huge demand a latent demand and a growing demand for petrochemical products in the country. As he mentioned, this, it, this is a sector which has a very rapid rate of growth. Uh, I think you said faster than cars and so on. That's impressive. I, I had thought that it was in the 8 to 9% uh, year range, but it's clearly uh, more than that. On the other hand, petrochemicals are also major sources of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and if not well managed they can also be sources of local pollution. This implies that the future of petrochemicals is a challenge. How do we meet the demands while also looking at the needs of the environment? If we look at uh, the current capacity in the country and Mr. Raghavind Rao and all of you know this far better than I do. We are looking at four gas and four naphtha crackers, and we are looking at a doubling of this capacity. Now, the challenge, of course, continues to be that is this going to be business as usual in the years to come? Petrochemicals is one of the most energy intensive industries in India and uh, uh, Siddharth uh, did mention of my previous uh, 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 role as in the Bureau of Energy Efficiency when we were trying to see how we could enhance the uh, energy efficiency of petrochemicals and introduce petrochemical plants in the PERFORM Achieve and Trade program 
with the goal of enhancing their specific energy consumption. Now, that's one step. And I'm very sure that the petrochemical industry would be able to meet the kinds of energy efficiency challenges that are put in place. But a much more difficult task is how do we move this to a carbon-free future? Is it possible? Well, at present, and uh, we, I'm extremely glad to welcome Laura Dare Turner, who would be one of the panelists today, uh, to share the work that the Energy Transitions Commission has been doing on looking at carbon-free alternatives, particularly in the harder to abate sectors of which petrochemicals is one. So at present it seems that there is a possibility that using renewables-based electricity or using bioenergy, it may be possible to move towards a zero carbon future. I think it is important that we place that on the table. As you have rapid growth, it is also important to see what are the kinds of challenges in the 20 year, 30 year, 40 year time frame, essentially a time frame which is within the economic life of the investments that are made. I want to commend the Government of India, the Department of Chemicals and Petrochemicals and Mr. Raghavind Rao for the kinds of uh, initiatives that have started. I look forward to hearing Mr. Raghavendra Rao uh, about the uh, challenges to sustainability and the kind of initiatives that are in place. Let me again welcome each one of you and look forward to initiating a discussion on the kinds of challenges and therefore the kinds of options that the petrochemicals industry faces in India and across the world. Thank you all very much for being here this morning. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. Um, now allow me to introduce our keynote speaker, Secretary Rao, from the Ministry of Chemicals and Fertilizers. Secretary Rao is an IS officer of the 1985 batch from the Haryana cadre. He is from Andhra Pradesh, a state very close to my heart because I spent most of my childhood there. Uh, before his appointment as secretary, uh, he was also in the Haryana state government as uh, additional chief secretary in town and country planning, housing, women and child development, urban planning, sorry, urban development, rural development, and a host of other portfolios. So with, finance. oh, yeah, very importantly, finance. So we are honored to have you here, secretary, sir, and look forward to your address. A few days back when uh, Girish came to me, <clears throat> when he broached the subject, I was telling him that uh, this report, which Peter has uh, prepared, there was a parliamentary question. Before I saw the report, I saw the question. The question was, that if the future of petrochemicals is going to be so much growth oriented, because of that, if the oil consumption or oil imports into India is going to increase very drastically, what are you going to do? What is the government going to do? So the question was slightly put in a different manner <clears throat> because the report says you must have gone through the report. <clears throat> it says that one third, one third of the additional oil demand by 2030 is going to be driven by petrochemicals. And it also says that the half of additional oil demand by 2050 also would be because of petrochemicals, if I, if I understood the, cost, the report correctly. So the question was that if petrochemicals are going to drive additional imports of oil, and already, I, please, please go ahead. So how is the country going to handle this additional imports of oil? Because we are already burdened with huge imports 
of oil. So, so that the question was slightly. So in that connection, while preparing the reply, so I said, what is this report? I have not heard about this report. So let me get a, get hold of the report. Then we got the through the internet and all that, the gist of it. And we prepared the answer. And of course, that's, that's history now. So when Girish came and then he told me uh, that uh, I must come here and participate in this discussion, <clears throat> I was very happy because I was very keen. In fact, uh, about a year back when I took over as uh, secretary of this department, one of the first questions, Nikhil is here, of course, from uh, Reliance. Pankaj Mehta, your colleague, he told me when I just joined that about 5 to 6% of the oil that is being consumed in this country is going towards development of petrochemicals. The talking points note which you people had given, perhaps talking about 9% in the country. That the difference could be perhaps because while processing the petrochemical industry, we use about 1 or 2% perhaps <coughs> oil and gas. Now, you see what, what happened was that the, the chemical petrochemical policy that was made uh, for the country was somewhere, sir, uh, 2007. There was a policy, sir, about what should be, what should the country do to develop petrochemicals? What should be the direction in which uh, the country should move to handle this petrochemicals? So policy was made in 2007. So now we are in 2019, so when I joined in 2018, so a lot of discussion was there that much water had flown. So whether we need to revisit this policy, whether uh, the objectives which, uh, which we wanted to achieve, whether we are going in the right direction or not. So in that context, a small committee consisting of uh, Secretary uh, MOPNG and uh, Secretary Chemicals and other people, <coughs> Is constituted to prepare a perspective plan. So we had a series of meetings jointly with MOPNG, Gay, LoNGC, you name it, everybody. We all sat together and then while preparing that, some useful data was emerging. <clears throat> Let me talk about the gist of the data because some is coming in this report perhaps some is because this is not country specific you are talking about the overall thing and you are talking of course you definitely touched on India you definitely touched on China and you touched about North America shale gas and uh, those things you definitely touched but if you want to drill down further what India needs to do perhaps we have to go further so while preparing this perspective plan we assessed what are the various projects that are already in place or already completed and under execution or in implementation. What are the pro projects that are under execution which are likely to mature or likely to get become operational in the next five, ten, ten, ten years? And what are the gaps? Interestingly, as per that plan, perspective plan that we were preparing, we felt that the, the shortage of petrochemicals in the country in terms of ethylene, let me talk in terms of ethylene first and then we'll talk about others. It was about 7.5 million tons of ethylene shortage by 2025. I understand that the report and the notes that was given to me, we are talking about 4.5, 4.6, 4. less than 5 million tons of ethylene now. But my uh, understanding is we are about 7 or so, 6.5, 7. The shortage, if we are to meet, if we are to go in for 
world scale plants not the small small plants we have plants which are a very small capacity we have about 0.22 also in assam so because of various reasons but if you want to go in for a world scale plant which is um which is sustainable and uh, economically viable we, we should talk about 1.5 million tons of ethylene capacity so we estimated that we would be requiring about five crackers five crackers by 2025 and about 14 crackers by 2040 so this was the estimate uh, we made so uh in fact when i was briefing the ministers so one of the points was why are we continuously relying only on fossil based fuels to to derive this so, so this is a correct question but the perhaps the alternatives are as of now i will say as of now not risen to the level that it becomes highly commercially viable and meets significant portions of the demand so Uh, in fact the report perhaps talks about 90% world over you're relying on uh, the fossil fuel based feed stocks to meet the petrochemical demand while doing this we were just wondering why there will be so much of shortage why there is so much of shortage i had been to the biggest refinery reliance jamnagar and had been visiting the things and talking to people <clears throat> now two three points are very important particularly in the context of india apart from the the fastest growing major economy which is everybody knows about it apart from that because you know why i'm talking about gdp it is the chemical petrochemical demand is always considered to be slightly higher than the growth rate of gdp in fact one estimate is about 1.3% always 1.3 times the gdp the, the demand for chemicals and petrochemicals are growing even though i was attending an international conference recently they, they in the conference uh, one of the speakers said that perhaps this 1.3 may go down to 1.1 maybe after 15 20 years but as of now that 1.3 1.4 still remains so that takes us if we are saying that in the, the country is going to grow at about 7 plus percent which is definitely the fastest amongst major economies not 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 simply saying the fastest in the world no perhaps that is not a correct statement major economy we must clarify that so our estimation was that maybe about 9.3% was one of the figures that was quoted for the next 5 7 years by 2025 from now till 2025 the demand for petrochemicals and chemicals in the country would be growing at about 9.3% then we said what is the world average world expectation of growth of petrochemicals and chemicals it is 5.5% this is an estimate it could be slightly here and there now so one is high growth rates of the country which is fueling the demand for high growth of chemicals and petrochemicals this is one the second is the population of the country you all know that we all know uh, we always say that we are the second largest uh, in terms of population in the world the most populous nations one of those but we our estimation is that it may not be too far in fact one estimate is 2023 somebody said 2024 somebody said 2022 also we could become the 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 largest the, the population country the biggest in, in terms of population we could become the most populous we could overtake china in the next 3 4 years that is the estimation third one third of the population in the country is already in urban areas and our estimation we again made lot of estimations that in the next 10 years or maybe by around 2030 we would be almost touching 
That means 50% of the population of this huge country, which is going to be the most populous country in the world, will be living in urban areas. It's all estimations, few years this way, that way. Popula the poverty levels in the country are definitely falling. The per capita income is increasing. All these factors are contributing to the growth of demand for chemicals and petrochemicals. Now, we are a very small player in the world. If I remember the figures correctly, our share in the world for chemicals and petrochemicals is just about 3%, just 3%. In fact, if, if I uh, again recollect the figures properly, the total world sales in terms of uh, chemicals and petrochemicals is about 5 trillion US dollars. Whereas in India, including fertilizers, including APIs, including chemicals and petrochemicals, we are about 163 billion US dollars of total sale, in terms of sales, last year, the 2017 figures which we have. So we are a very small player. But, but the point to be noted is the rate at which the world is growing, the rate at which India, Indian industry, chemical industry is growing, that needs to be seen. Again, our estimations are that by 2025, the total market for chemicals and petrochemicals in India is going to be about crossing 300 billions. It won't be very far. Now, if you have to meet that demand, that huge demand for chemicals and petrochemicals, naturally you require adequate feedstocks. Building blocks are required for the chemical petrochemical industry. And so, which are mostly coming from the fossil fuel route as of now. Whether it is ethane gas or, of course, this is natural things. So the, the talk of coal gasification, converting coal to first uh, syngas and then to methanol, methanol to olefins, methanol to aromatics, and we are all talking about it, but Due to various reasons, perhaps it will take a lot of time. So, <clears throat> when while preparing these uh, estimations and for future of petrochemicals, which is the main topic, how do we meet the demand? If the country is growing so fast, and country is, the middle class is growing, urban areas are growing, the, there is a general growth amongst the industry, in fact, now uh, our contribution in the manufacturing sector is about slightly less than 14 percent, the, the chemical industry. The projections are that it should be at least 25 percent of the manufacturing sector by 2025. So if we are aiming at that and our Contribution of the GDP is also just about 2.5 percent. So if that has to grow, if the, if the share in the manufacturing sector has to grow significantly, then we require a lot of good amount of feedstock, as well as, of course, naturally from there, the building blocks. So what are those gaps? How to fill those gaps was being debated, discussed. And of course, the, the, uh, uh, the basic aim of that parliamentary question was that uh, if we are importing, if you're going to import huge quantities of crude oil to con be converted into naphtha, to be converted into building blocks, to be converted into chemicals and petrochemicals, okay, whether the country can afford, whether this huge, already there's so much of outgo of foreign exchange because our production of uh, the, the country's production, the domestic production of crude and natural gas is perhaps dwindling. So how do we meet that gap? Now, in that context, we were talking. Now, government has taken, or rather is taking several measures to, to, to ensure that there is adequate investment 
in the chemical and petrochemical sector to meet these gaps, significant gaps. Apart from various uh, popular schemes, we have Make in India, Swachh Bharat. You see, all the schemes, in fact, I, I can name 10 schemes, directly or indirectly, they are going to impact the demand of chemicals and petrochemicals. It is touching our daily lives. In fact, the report also talks about it. You name the sector, perhaps directly or indirectly, chemicals and petrochemical sector is contributing significantly to that sector. You name, take agriculture. In fact, initially I was thinking how agriculture has uh, a relationship with, apart from fertilizers and all that. So, so agrochemicals, not only agrochemicals, even the PVC pipes, which are going to help the uh, irrigation uh, part of the whole thing. So the significant part. Then health care, you name it infrastructure, construction, packaging, you, you name the sector perhaps definitely in a, in a small way or a big way, chemicals and petrochemicals are going to enter the picture. So all the schemes, you have Startup India, Makeup India, Swachh Bharat, you, you name the scheme, the more attention is being paid for successful implementation of these schemes, there will be a, an impact on the demand for chemicals and petrochemicals. So that is one. The second thing we all know that uh, the government has been uh, very proactive in attracting investments. So uh, ease of doing business, just see the way it has really taken off. And I was looking at startups, innovation, even in innovation also, startups, India, the way India is emerging is definitely something to be taken note of. And I'm sure in the days to come. Now, GST, taxation regime. Now, licensing system, practically in chemicals and petrochemicals, except for some hazardous chemicals and petrochemicals, you don't require a license. You can go and establish thing, uh, chemical units and petrochemical units. The, the contribution of chemical petrochemical sector in both imports and exports is about 10% plus. It's a very significant thing and, and it's good thing is it is rising, it is improving. So all these factors, both from the government side as well as the, the inherent strengths of the country in terms of uh, pop, higher population, falling poverty levels, and higher um, disposable incomes. All these things are fueling the demand for petrochemicals. That's why it is quite natural that the projections that have been made about 9% plus for the growth of the chemical petrochemical sector appears to be a very reasonable one. And also the multiplication factor that this growth would be definitely much higher than the GDP growth of a country is also perhaps fairly correct. So given this scenario, we were wondering <clears throat> how, who will invest because each, each cracker, a steam cracker of 1.5 million tons, we were estimating what would be the investments required based on whether we will go in for a naphtha cracker or a gas cracker or a dual feed cracker, it was slightly varying. But our estimations are is about 40,000 crores, around 40,000 crores per cracker. So if we require five crackers, 200,000 crores. This is the estimation. So I presented these figures before the parliamentary standing committee saying that, of course, these are all estimates, future, the very topic is future. I don't know where is your know, future of petrochemicals. Yes, future of pet petrochemicals. And the other of topic is of sustainability. In fact, I was telling Girish and uh, others that before joining here, when I was in the finance department, I was also looking after sustainable development goals. Very important that we don't lose track of the sustainability. Ajay Mathur also was rightly pointing it out about the sustainability of the sector. So if you have to sustain, we have to take care of the future of the Mother Earth, definitely. 
every day I keep on getting a lot of messages about plastics, the way they are, they are destroying the environment and the way they are entering. In fact, the, the announcement that single-use plastics will be banned in the country by 2022. So what constitutes single-use is a debatable point. Debatable, highly debatable point. If I say that uh, pet bottle, fortunately pet bottles are not here, good. So if a pet bottle is there, you just use it and throw it. You say it's a single-use plastic. But take an autom automobile, a car, in which a lot of plastics are there. In fact, somebody said that in, in an aircraft, the, the percentage of uh, plastic components is about uh, 15%. 20%, 15 to 20%. So whether you call it single use, because the aircraft, if, it's, if it is flying for 20 years, 25 years, after that, if it is discarded, maybe 30 years, whether you, that's a single use only. Or in a uh, car, you have a dashboard and all that made of plastics and all that, whether you call it single use, it's just definitely a single use, because then after that, but, but it will be used, it will be thrown off after 15 years, say maybe 20 years. So what constitutes single use plastic? If we have to ban it by 2022, are we going to ban the dashboards and aircraft things? Or so there is a debatable point. So the government constituted a, a committee under the chairmanship of Professor Mashelkar as of now. Whatever is used in the packaging industry. Yes. That, that is your definition, no? But yeah. that, that there is a other people are also there in the. <laughs> there are people. There are people who say single use means one use. What is what constitutes one use? If I put it in a car, and it, unless the car is di, well, discarded after 20 years, 20, 30 years, it's a single use. If we are not using for another car. We are not taking out the dashboard and keeping it another car. She so said this is also single use. So whether we are going to ban that, what is the definition? Nikhil, you agree with me? The big debatable point. Experts. Correct. This is, this is your definition, this is his definition, I have another definition, he may have another definition. Everybody is having definitions. What constitutes single use? It depends on which, you see, when people come to me, they come from different sections of the industry. So one section vehemently talks about one definition, the other section of the industry vehemently opposes that. So we need to come up with a definition. What, what are we going to ban by 2022? We should be very clear. So the experts are still looking into it. Several countries have done it. We should learn from their experience. But there is a problem. You see, if there is a problem. We must realize that there is a problem. There is a challenge. There is an issue which needs to be addressed. How to do it in the most appropriate manner? is the answer. Okay, so we, we are working on that and uh, the so-called PCPIRs as per the 2007 policy, the four PCPIRs and three are on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. We wanted to fine-tune those PCA policy in such a manner that they'd really attract investments in this sector. It's a very important sector. We also have this scheme for plastic parks and there's so many other centers of excellence also. We have. So a lot of work is being done, a lot of inputs are being sought from the industry, and together we want to take it to the next level. So I wanted to, in fact, uh, speak less and uh, participate more. I want to, wanted to hear the experts speak more about the future of uh, the petrochemical industry. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity to share my views and thoughts today. And, uh, Maybe I'll hear for some more time and then I'll leave. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Secretary, sir, for a very insightful keynote uh, speech. Uh, as much as IEA has come here with some analysis, we are here also to learn from you. So thank you for, for, for making those very invaluable comments. 
Uh, I'd like to now invite uh, my colleague Peter Levy uh, to make a presentation on the future of petrochemicals. Uh, just a bit of background. Uh, so Peter is an energy analyst in the Energy Technology and Policy Division of uh, IEA. He focuses on analyzing energy intensive industries, but also on cross-cutting technology and policy themes with respect to decarbonization especially. So Peter has attended the University of Cambridge for his PhD and MPhil uh, and postgraduate degrees in engineering. So Peter, over to you. Well, thank you all, and thank you, Sid, for the warm introduction. Thank you, Secretary Rao, for your uh, contribution there, uh, insightful um, contributions and your contributions to research in general that we have found very valuable at the IEA. Thank you to Dr. Ajay Mathur uh, for um, his uh, leadership in the energy and sustainability space and for being a, a great friend to the IEA as, uh, as director of the Energy and Resources Institute. Um, it's a, it's a great honor to be able to address you all today uh, on behalf of the IEA, and I look forward to discussing with the panel the findings of the report after I present. Um, just to give a bit of background for those of you who are less familiar, um, the IEA is an organization that works with countries all around the world to support clean energy transitions, uh, provide insights and analysis uh, on all aspects of the energy system. The global IEA family, as we refer to it, includes member and accession countries, shown on this slide, um, and also association and partner countries, of which India is one, and the IEA is working very closely with India on several topics at the moment. Um, and then also the IEA works with several other countries beyond its membership to gather data that it publishes in its uh, annual and monthly statistics and in a whole host of publications on a variety of energy topics. And so the IEA has been using this data for uh, several deep dives into specific topics that our executive director, Fatih Birol, refers to as blind spots in the energy system. And these are areas of the energy system that perhaps don't garner as much attention as they might deserve, given their, uh, their importance today or their prospective importance in the future. So this future of series that we're here to talk about one aspect of today started in 2017 with the future of trucks, uh, then the future of cooling, came followed shortly afterwards focusing on air conditioners and the electricity demand associated with that and then the latest installment was actually launched in India uh, last month by our executive director Fati Burol uh, and members of the team who who published the report and that was on the future of rail with a specific focus on India here I'm today to talk about the future of petrochemicals uh, which was launched also by Fati Burol in London in 2018 in October. All of these publications are available for free download on the IEA's website. So I want to move fairly briskly through the first section of the talk, which is an overview of, of uh, what petrochemicals are uh, doing today in the uh, energy system and their role in society. My slides have come back now. Um, I'll then talk about two of our modeling scenarios, a, uh, a reference scenario, a baseline scenario in which we project forward current trends, a more sustainable scenario that I'll go into a bit more detail on, and then finish with a, an overview of our policy recommendations from, from the report. I'll go a bit more quickly with this because several of these aspects have been covered by the, the previous two speakers um, and uh, touched upon by, by several people already. So. This is the infographic that we produced is to stress the ubiquity of petrochemical products. So we have examples here from our homes and offices, uh, fiber uh, used for clothing, electronic devices, also PVC pipes, which were mentioned already. Um, we have petrochemical products being instrumental in our food supply. So fertilizers uh, produced from natural gas, um, also from coal. Plastic packaging becoming ever more present in our delivery of food to the plate. Examples of petrochemical products in transportation, tires, batteries, uh, components of batteries um, and other components of cars, uh, luggage that we use to, to um, transport ourselves and our belongings around. And then aspects of the energy system. So not only the equipment we require today, but also the uh, equipment that will facilitate the clean energy future that we are aiming for. So wind turbine blades are a great example with polyacrylic and light trail and uh, carbon fiber being used, uh, used there, but also solar panels and other pieces of equipment. This uh, role in society, 
underpins its uh, role in, in the energy system, but also understates its rise to prominence as a sector. So relative to other bulk materials, the petrochemical sector has been growing very fast. A key group of petrochemical products, namely plastics, um, have grown by more than tenfold since 1970. This is global volumes. Most of what I will show on the slides, are, I should say, are global, uh, global quantities. This uh, rapid rise to prominence, as I said, underpins the petrochemical sector's uh, key role in the energy system. Around 14% of oil demand globally is used to produce petrochemicals, um, and uh, gas, we're looking at 8%. This is around 13 million barrels per day, or, or MBD, and uh, for gas, it's 300 uh, billion cubic meters, I believe. The way that the chemical sector um, consumes energy has a key idiosyncrasy to it. So we use this term feedstock to refer to the use of fuels as raw material inputs to the sector. So this Sankey diagram shows how oil, gas, and in fact some coal as well, predominantly in China, enter the petrochemical supply chain at the upstream end of the system, are transformed into chemicals what, that we call primary chemicals. Those are the ones that we focus on in the report because they consume the most energy in their production. This is uh, methanol, ammonia, and high-value chemicals. High-value chemicals is the ethylene and propylene um, that was uh, talked about in the previous uh, address. Um, and then these uh, chemicals are combined, transformed, and uh, go through a, a whole series of chemical reactions before they emerge from the sector as the products that we are familiar with, plastics, fiber, uh, fertilizers, a whole host of other um, applications. The primary chemicals that are referred to, the ones we focus on, account for roughly two-thirds of the sector's energy consumption. So they're a convenient boundary around which to draw our analysis. When we look at where feedstocks are used and the extent to which petrochemicals are produced in different regions, uh, we see that no one size fits all for the chemical sector. We've got a, around half of the chemical production, primary chemical production, taking place in the Asia Pacific region. We keep at the, the aggregated kind of continental regional level in this analysis. Um, but then the US, uh, sorry, North America, uh, Europe, and the Middle East also being um, very important regions, accounting for most of the rest. And then when we look at feedstocks, we see uh, a, a very different uh, story in different regions of the world. So the US and Middle East uh, having access to low-cost ethane, in the US's case from the shale gas revolution, allows these regions to have a feedstock advantage because they can produce high-yielding high um, uh, slates of petrochemicals uh, from relatively low-cost feedstock. Those are the four regions that I identified as important. And then just uh, moving to the key environmental challenge that the sector faces, although not the only one. Um, this graph shows the energy, the final energy consumption and also the direct CO2 emissions of each of the uh, large volume material producing sectors. And we can see here petrochemicals being first among energy consumers within industry, but third among emitters. And this is because of this key um, embedding of carbon feedstock in the, uh, sorry, embedding of carbon in the feedstock usage of these fuels that I, uh, that I referred to before. Um, this is an account of where the emissions take place within the industrial sectors that are identified. But of course, this does not speak to the downstream emissions or indeed upstream emissions from power production or refined fuels. So now a very brief overview of our baseline scenario in which petrochemicals um, are projected, the trends around the petrochemical industry are projected forward, um, taking account of announced capacity additions uh, and announced policies in this that are relevant to this space. This sector, this scenario is not just done in isolation, it's done in, in a broader modeling uh, context and framework, and it takes its broader energy context from the new policy scenario of the world energy outlook. So a word on demand, this is plastics, key, key thermoplastics, um, and how they grow globally between 2010 and 2050, or how they're projected to grow during that period, with the base year of the analysis 2017 shown there as well. Um, more than a doubling takes place in absolute terms between 2010 and 2050. 
um, and per capita demand increases by around 50% during that period. And this is as developing nations um, increase their wealth and uh, population levels, they uh, approach the levels of consumption in, in plastic that we see in some of uh, some developed regions around the world. I should say we also explore high demand uh, sensitivity analysis, which is shown there with the with the hollow hollow dots on the circle uh, the diamonds, and and that's provided more detail in terms of the implications for analysis in the annex that accompanies the publication online. And then moving forward to this uh, famous graph that has been uh, already some numbers have been quoted from it today. Of the 10 million barrels, uh, roughly 10 million barrels per day of demand growth forecasted for the global energy system, um, petrochemicals accounts for around a third, more than a third in fact, and then 50%, around 50% uh, if you look forward to 2050. But gen now just focusing on the demand growth to 2030, we've got shipping accounting for our, around 1 million barrels per day of, of world demand growth glo uh, caused by... Uh, uh, growth in demand for seaborne trade. This is 0.6 on the slide because it's aggregated with some other sectors that are declining, and power and buildings. Passenger vehicles um, growing by around 1.6 million barrels per day. Aviation by 1.7, trucks by 2.5, and petrochemicals with around 3.2 million barrels per day of oil demand growth. Taking a, a look at the regional dynamics, Asia Pacific retains its position as the, uh, the number one region for petrochemical production, of primary chemical production, uh, in 2050 as it is today. Um, the longer term growth in the, in the system is, is driven indeed by Asia Pacific, but also by the Middle East. Um, in the short term, we see a strong growth in the United States as well. On the feedstock front for the growth, as you can see here, I'm not sure if the colors are well distinguished, but the light blue is this ethane uh, that we see leading a lot of the growth that takes place up to 2030 in the Middle East and in, uh, the, and in North America's region, but mainly the US. Um, but then we see where stronger growth is projected forward from 2030 to 2050 in the Middle East, uh, ethane starts to get tight and then the Middle East switches back over to using uh, more naphtha to supply its longer term growth. Asia Pacific and Europe continue more or less on, on naphtha for high value chemicals. For ammonia, feedstocks remain in familiar territory for sure, so a lot of gas used around the world and then coal uh, plateauing in China as China's demand for ammonia doesn't grow strongly and then gas used elsewhere in Asia Pacific. So now the thing that I wanted to spend a bit more time on was the uh, clean technology scenario. So this is our alternative, more sustainable pathway for the chemical sector. Um, and this scenario is very different from the reference technology scenario. It sets where we want to get to, so a more sustainable chemical sector defined by some United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or the fulfillment of some of those, uh, and then works backwards to see what we need to do to get there. It takes its broader energy system context from the sustainable development scenario from the World Energy Outlook uh, and is broad, broadly aligned with that context. So where we want to get to, obviously, is a more sustainable uh, chemical sector, more sustainable chemical production. And this, uh, in, in this analysis, this translates into the consideration of uh, air pollutants, water pollutants, water demand, and CO2 emissions. In the clean technology scenario, relative to the relative to today, these um, the declines in each of these pollutant categories are as follows: air pollution declines by about 85%, water pollutants by more than 90%. And when I'm talking about water pollutants, the quantifying uh, metric here is uh, plastic leakage into the world's oceans, uh, and CO2 emissions are about 45% lower than they are today in the clean technology scenario. So the next, slide, the next few slides in this section just um, provide more detail on how uh, the scenario is composed and how we, how we get to these declines. So a very hot topic at the moment and uh, an instrumental um, feature of the clean technology scenario is uh, the demand for primary chemicals and how this demand is met, uh, whether it's via recycling or via virgin production routes. 
So demand for plastics remains the same in the clean technology scenario, but the way in which this demand can be met is uh, the, there are these two options of producing via secondary routes or producing via primary routes. Um, the purple bars on this slide show the secondary production levels in the clean technology scenario, whereas the blue bars show the uh, reference technology scenario. And then the green bars show the um, number, uh, number of tons of primary chemical savings that result from these increased recycling levels. The red dashed, uh, uh, dashed lines and dots show the ranges of collection rates for uh, plastic waste that uh, take place on a global average basis in the, in the um, different scenarios. Um, collection rates for, global, for plastic waste globally nearly triple between 2017 and 2050 in the, in the clean technology scenario. And this is as the shares of plastic production um, in the world or plastic consumption in the world shift to regions that see relatively low rates today. So this nearly tripling may sound like a moderately uh, ambitious feat, but it's actually, it's, it's pretty ambitious. This results in around 70 million tons of primary chemical savings by 2050, or around 7% of primary chemical production. This is the oil demand context of the uh, reference technology scenario and the clean technology scenario in the broader energy system. So increasing from 16% to 26%, uh, both in 2050, from the reference to the clean technology scenario. And this is... Uh, in the context of other traditional aspects of oil demand declining dramatically in the in the clean technology scenario, um, I think the so the the difference in oil demand between the two scenarios by 2050 is around 2.4 million barrels per day, and this is as a result of that increased uh, recycling level. If I just delve a bit more deeply into this context, and I believe we have some. Uh, data specific for, for, specifically for India on this slide. Um, this is a nice little finding that we were able to pull out of the broader energy context uh, analysis that we, we um, are aligned with. Uh, today in the US and the EU, per capita oil demand for road passenger transport is between two and five times that uh, for plastic consumption. In China and India, the ratio is smaller, but the uh, road passenger transport consumption is still higher. An interesting feature of the clean technology scenario is that in all four of these regions, per capita oil demand for plastic consumption overtakes that for road passenger transport by 2050. So that's a, an interesting dynamic in, in terms of the change of what we think of as conventional uh, sources of oil demand. Petrochemicals are the largest segment of oil demand by 2050 um, at 16 million barrels per day. Um, far higher than the seven million, 7 million barrels per day for uh, road passenger transport by that time. Ooh, sorry, went too far there. So despite continuing growth in oil demand, um, there's a significant emissions decline in the clean technology scenario by about 45% by 2050 uh, relative to two days levels. Um, this represents a 60% decline relative to the a reference case in 2050, uh, or a roughly a 25% reduction in cumulative emissions um, over the whole period. So how can oil demand keep on rising, whilst, uh, it, albeit slower than in the reference case, um, while emissions undergo a rapid decline? Um, and the reason is because of this oil consumption as feedstock, uh, partially, and also some other mitigation measures that come into play. So if I, this pie chart provides a good a summary of the overall um, emission uh, mitigation categories that we've, we've grouped all of the technology analysis that goes under PINs this work uh, into carbon capture utilization and storage is one category, the leading category of emissions uh, mitigation. Um, the shift from coal feedstocks to the use of natural gas feedstocks. Um, Energy efficiency, so incre incremental increases in energy efficiency, but also uh, step changes as a result of a change to a different technology. Uh, plastic recycling, so the impact of reducing the demand for primary chemicals. And the use of alternative feedstocks, 
uh, such as electrolytic hydrogen and bioenergy. So to provide a bit more detail on the leading lever of mitigation um, identified in the analysis, the chemical sector, um, this is carbon capture utilization and storage. Uh, the, carbon, uh, the petrochemical sector hosts the largest CCU, carbon capture and utilization uh, application today. This is the utilization of CO2 to make urea. Um, and this is shown by the lighter blue bars. This grows at a modest pace during the scenario, but carbon capture uh, for permanent storage needs to grow at a much more rapid rate in the clean technology scenario than in the reference technology scenario in order to mitigate these emissions. Um, by 2050, capture for permanent storage overtakes the quantity being utilized for urea production uh, with around 220 million tons being captured and stored annually. Uh, from a mixture of both concentrated sources from ammonia production, but also dilute sources from elsewhere in the in the primary chemical uh, in just, uh, primary chemical production supply chain, and this means that around 35% of the CO2 that is being generated in the sector is being captured, utilised, and or stored by that by that point. And then moving to touch on one of the uh, key environmental problems garnering much attention around the world that is linked uh, at the other end of the supply chain to this, to this sector, and this is plastic leakage into the world's oceans. Um, so when disposed of improperly, plastics can, uh, can and do end up in the world's uh, watercourses, uh, including the ocean. Um, and there's been a lot of scientific research in this uh, field uh, revealing how, how bad this problem has got uh, in recent years. In the reference technology scenario, the base scenario, with no firm global coordinated commitment to reduce this uh, impact of uh, plastic waste leakage, um, then it, this results in cumulative volumes of plastic waste entering the world's ocean to undergo a tenfold increase from already unacceptable levels. In the clean technology scenario, the rapid and broad-based improvements in re um, waste management that would be necessitated to facilitate the recycling rate increases that we were talking about, a near tripling in, in, in collection rates. Um, this lays the groundwork for more than halving the cumulative ocean-bound plastic waste vo volume by that period. And this does not take into account any uh, efforts to remove plastic waste from the ocean and to uh, get that cumulative curve to bend downwards. These, will, these are likely to be required in such a scenario in addition to the, the curbing of the, of the entry to the ocean. So to conclude, I'd just like to give an overview of our top 10 policy recommendations that we um, uh, got from the report, that we developed in the report. Um, and these this is to emphasize the fact that the clean technology scenario will not materialize by itself or is very unlikely to materialize by itself. It needs the support of, of, of governments around the world, coordination um, and policies in multiple areas. We decided to unusually for IEA reports divide these policy recommendations among two categories, those that target the production arena and those that pr target the use and disposal phases of chemical production. Uh, so these first five recommendations will be more familiar to those of you who read other IEA reports. Uh, so there's, there's a need to stimulate research and development in uh, sustainable chemical production. So this is uh, innovative process routes such as carbon capture utilization and storage, but also electrolytic hydrogen and bioenergy based routes. Um, establish and extend plant-based uh, benchmarking me me mechanisms um, that allow plants to learn from others' uh, initiatives to increase their energy performance. Pursue regulatory actions to reduce CO2 emissions. Require industry to meet uh, stringent air quality standards. We are not going to see the incentives to install the uh, correct equipment to reduce air, air, air pollution reduction mechanisms in industry unless we have uh, policy support for it. And then there's the uh, need to make sure that fuel and feedstock prices reflect uh, their actual market value and are not distorted by uh, any harmful subsidies. 
And then this second set that more targets the use and disposal phases of chemical products. So we include this recommendation to reduce reliance on single-use plastics other than those that are for non-essential, uh, non-substitutable purposes. And again, we are uh, cautious not to ring fence to a too prescriptive of a definition around this what is single use, although uh, some of our colleagues at the UN, or who I believe we're joined by uh, some people from the UN today, um, have, uh, have produced a report on single use plastics. Um, improve waste management practice around the world in order to facilitate uh, the recycling rates that we need to get to in the CTS, uh, but also to um, curb and eventually um, eliminate the uh, leakage of plastic waste into the world's watercourses. We need to raise consumer awareness about the multiple benefits of recycling and disposing of products in, a, um, in an ethical and environmentally sustainable way. Design products with disposable mi disposal in mind in the first place so that they are easier to collect and dispose of. And then perhaps one kind of related mechanism would be to extend producer responsibility down the value chain to try and uh, incentivize this, um, things like the... Uh, uh, the measures that are prescribed in the in the circular economy and other initiatives of its type. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening, and I in, uh, look forward to talking with our panel. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, to those who want to download the report, it's available at ia.org slash petrochemicals. Um, I will now invite our esteemed panelists to take the stage uh, and uh, you know discuss the future of petrochemicals. Yes, sir. So it's uh, up to you. If you want to be a part of the panel, uh, sure, sir. Okay. Uh, and I mean, I'm sure uh, a few of you may have had questions on the presentation. We can uh, arrange for uh, a question-answer session right at the end, uh, along with the uh, panel discussion. So um, the, this panel will be chaired and moderated by Mr. Ajay Shankar, just, just a very brief one, is uh, a distinguished, uh, distinguished fellow at Terry and the former Secretary of uh, Power and DIPP with the Government of India and he is joined by uh, Lord Adair Turner who is a Chair of the Energy Transition Commission based in London, uh, Mr. Nikhil Deshpande, the Senior Vice President at RIL, Mr. Milan Deore, Director of the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, Mr. Ravi Kumar Agarwal, patron of the All India Plastic Industries Association, and Peter, and of obviously, and now the secretary also. So uh, thank you all for being here, and uh, we look forward to a very uh, interesting discussion up ahead. We are constrained for time. So without much ado, I'll request Lord Adair Turner for his insights. Thank you very this, much. On it's a uh, really important issue because to me, yeah. this was education that yeah. how big a role petrochemicals will play on the scenario 30, 40 years down the road. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here at this World Sustainable Development Summit and to be uh, responding to uh, this very, very fine report which uh, Peter has produced uh, for the IEA uh, on the future of petrochemicals. Uh, at the Energy Transition uh, commission, uh, which I co-chair uh, along with R.J. Mathur, uh, we've been very pleased to have a very close working relationship uh, with various experts at the IEA. Uh, just for those of you who don't know, uh, the Energy uh, Transitions Commission is a global coalition of major companies from many sectors, from the renewable energy sector, sir, but also BP and Shell uh, from the fossil fuel sector. Uh, it is, uh, has Indian members such as Tata Group, Dalmia Cement, uh, Chinese members such as the w major wind turbine manufacturer uh, Envision, uh, French, German, British, uh, etc. And we are working on the challenge of how do we describe a believable path to a zero carbon economy compatible with the Paris Climate Agreements while still delivering the very significant increases in energy supply and plastic supply which will be required in developing countries in order for them to have uh, a standard of living like the developed. Uh, we've recently produced a report called Mission Possible which is focused on the hard to abate sectors of the economy, the most difficult sectors of the economy, uh, which are sectors like steel, cement, and 
petrochemicals, as well as long-distance aviation like aviation uh, and shipping. And our message in Mission Possible, it says it on the tin as it were, is that it is absolutely possible even in these sectors of the economy to get to net zero emissions by about 2050 or 2060 across the world at a very low economic cost. Now, where does petrochemicals fit within that? I think what's interesting is that I think the future of petrochemicals will, in a sense, determine the future of oil and gas, as well as playing a crucial role in determining whether we meet the Paris climate agreements. The key point, the key background point, background point to realize is that some aspects of how we achieve a low carbon economy are increasingly clear and we can be very confident about them. We know how to decarbonize power systems and tomorrow RJ and I will be launching the results of an ETC India project that says that India could easily get to 30% variable renewables generating within its power system by 2030, 45% by then will be zero carbon, and we are confident that systems can go on to power systems which are 85% dependent on variable renewables uh, in the long term. We might also use nuclear as well, but we know how to decarbonize power systems. We also know how to decarbonize surface transport and the future is electric, whether it's battery or electric or hydrogen electric, there's a balance there to be struck, but it's electric and I think it's gonna be electric far faster for trucks as well as autos than most people currently know. And we know how to decarbonize shipping. And by the way, that's an interesting one. It may involve massive use of ammonia. You can, build, you can burn ammonia in existing ship uh, engines uh, which will create a demand for hydrogen, and we know how to run uh, aeroplanes on bioenergy. And if you put all that together, the fact that we know how to decarbonize shipping and aviation and autos, I think that is a world in which there could be much more significant falls in demand for oil for transportation than people at the moment realize. At the moment, about 60% of oil goes into all the different <coughs> transportation uses, whether it be road transport, shipping, or aviation. And I think that that could decline, that 60% could decline far faster than people realize. As for gas, 40% of gas goes to produce power. And in some parts of the world, it's not only used for gas peaking plants, but for base load, for instance, in the US uh, and in Britain. But I think eventually we will see gas as being used as one among several ways in which we can meet the last 15% of power systems which are difficult <coughs> to meet in a renewable fashion. And when that occurs, I think the de demands for gas may turn out to be much less than some people talk about in terms of gas as a transition fuel. I think it will be eventually undercut by renewables. But even though there are those very significant, and I think far more radical actually than many of the IEO, IEA figures suggest, far more radical <coughs> threats to the transportation demand for oil and the power demand for gas than most scenarios suggests, I think where it is likely that we are going to see increasing demand for oil and gas uh, is in the petrochemical uh, arena. And the IEA CTS, the uh, Clean Technology Scenario, sees 35% of oil demand in 2050 going into petrochemicals. I must admit, my belief is it's going to be a much bigger percentage than that 35%. I think the majority of oil use in 2050 is going to be petrochemicals because I think we're underestimating how fast oil use in transportation uh, is going uh, to come down. But it will be significant, and uh, in the long run, I think the vast majority of all oil demand is essentially going to be in petrochemicals. So we've got a crucial question here. Will we have a route to the eventual decarbonization of petrochemicals, and what are the most uh, likely routes? And I think we have to start on that question by distinguishing 
two really quite different challenges, and they are within Peter's work, but he didn't quite stress the challenge. I think we face a quite different challenge between ammonia <coughs> and plastics. We face a challenge of what to do about the fact that we produce 180 million tons of ammonia per year, 55% of which goes into urea fertilizers. And that's really quite a separate problem from what do we do about the 380 million tons, but it could be 800 million tons by 2050, of thermoplastics, thermosets, fibers, and elastomers. So let me make a point about each of these challenges. I think, essentially, solving ammonia and making that zero carbon is a much easier thing to think about and a much easier thing to decarbonize than decarbonizing the totality of plastics. It's easier to think about because actually there's probably only two ways to decarbonize ammonia production, which essentially means decarbonizing the production of hydrogen because that's where the CO2 in ammonia production uh, emerges, in hydrogen. We can do one of two things. We can take an existing steam methane reforming process and we can add carbon <coughs> capture and storage to it. And as uh, Peter says, in order for that to work, we will have to not only capture the CO2 that we already capture and put into urea fertilizer, we will cap have to capture even more, and he showed us those figures. Or we have to use hydrogen to electrolyze, from, that we have to make hydrogen from the electrolysis of, of water. And what's interesting in the figures we're looking at, and they are consistent with Peter's figures, is that either of those routes may not be all that expensive. For a variety of reasons, so essentially CCS from ammonia, much of the carbon capture, the bit which comes from the process emissions, is one of the cheaper forms of carbon to capture because it comes in a relatively pure stream uh, to start with. And we also believe that the electricity route uh, may be uh, even cheaper still. So the CCS route, compared with a lot of the things for decarbonizing aviation or shipping, decarbonizing uh, the CO2 in ammonia is just not that uh, expensive, either per tonne of CO2 or for the whole economy. But we think there is at least a possibility that electrolysis may be cheaper yet. Now, Peter's own figures in his full report <coughs> set out a scenario in which he says, well, if your electrolyzers were utilized 35%, if you could assume that renewable electricity would be available at or below $30 per megawatt hour, and if your electrolyzer equipment cost at or below 400 to $480 per kilowatt, then electrolysis could be cheaper than SMR plus CCS. And our belief is that those figures in Peter's scenario are absolutely believable. Indeed, we think that we will relatively soon be in an environment where it could be cheaper still. The crucial thing I think we have to understand about electrolyzer equipment is that it's likely to become radically cheaper because the scale of the hydrogen economy is likely to be radically bigger. Both we and Sky, Sh Shell, in their recent Sky scenario, believe that the path to a decarbonized global economy is likely to achieve a massive increase in the role of hydrogen. From 60 million tons a year produced today to something like 600 million tons by mid-century. Because hydrogen is going to be used to produce ammonia for shipping. It's going to be used to decarbonize steel. It may well be used for long-distance trucks, even if autos are dominated by battery electric. It could be used in all sorts of ways. At the moment, only 3 million of the 60 million tons <coughs> are produced by electrolysis. We could well imagine a future environment in which 400 million out of the 600 million tons or so is produced by electrolysis. It's quite possible to imagine the total volumes of electrolysis increasing 150 times over the next several decades. And we know from solar PV what happens to the costs of bits of electrical equipment, electrochemical equipment, 
once you increase scale 100 times. And indeed, if you just take classic learning curve effects, where each doubling of the volume might produce a 20% decrease in the cost, with those sort of figures, we would expect electrolyzer equipment not to be, as in Peter's scenario, 60% cheaper, but 80 or 90% cheaper. And indeed, we are already talking to people in the electrolyzer business who already think that within five to 10 years, or even less, they will have electrolyzers uh, even cheaper uh, than in Peter's 2050 scenario. So we think the electrolyzer route for ammonia could be far more rapid uh, than is set out in the IEA report. So in a sense, we're saying, think of ammonia as probably easier to think about, because it's either CCS or electrolysis, and probably <laughs> relatively cheap to do by either route. Not a big challenge uh, for decarbonization in the global economy. But let's turn to plastics. Plastics are much more complex. And one of the great things about Peter's report is if you read the guts of it, it explains the complexity. We're not dealing here with one product. We're dealing with hundreds of different products, which are produced in multiple different routes with different degrees of integration with the, refining, uh, uh, the refinery market. And there are multiple different ways in which we could decarbonize them. So it's just inherently complicated. But despite the multiplicity, I think some things are clear. Very quickly, five things. One, when we talk about decarbonizing plastics, we must focus on end of use, end of life emissions, as much as on production emissions. When you produce plastics, it varies with the type of plastics, you might have CO2 emissions of two tons of CO2 per ton of plastic produced. If you burn the plastic in an incinerator at the end of life, you are probably going to produce two and a half tons of CO2 per ton of plastic. So incinerating it at the end of life can be even more important to total CO2 emissions than the production process. And we have to have a vision of how we take the CO2 out of plastics at end of life as well as in the production process. Point two, which follows from that, we have got to get very, very serious about recycling, but we can. We, in our report, we had a detailed report done by a, a consulting company called Material Economics who looked in real detail at the potential to do plastics uh, recycling, both in a mechanical recycling form in which you take, for instance, a particular type of plastics like PET and you recycle it as PET from plastic bottle back into plastic bottle uh, and in a chemical recycling fashion where you are breaking down uh, the chemistry back into its fundamental molecules and reconstituting them. To achieve more of the former, we have to get much better at separating our plastic streams, about making sure that they are not uh, made impure by all sorts of colorants and dyes, etc., because those things make it very difficult to do pure recycling, what's called closed-loop recycling, rather than recycling in which everything ends up as a black plastic flower pot uh, because it gets slowly blacker and blacker over time. We have to get much better at mechanical recycling, but we can and we can also get that much better at chemical recycling. And we think there is a believable story of a future in which only 30% of the new plastics we are consuming each year are coming from virgin production of a fossil fuel or a biomass feedstock, and 70% are essentially coming from recycled plastics which had been made a year or 10 years before. Now, one crucial point, people sometimes say, yes, well, that's obviously true for the developed world, but you've already got to stability in terms of how much plastics you have as a stock. What about the developing world? Well, it still doesn't matter because as long as when you produce plastics now, you can be confident that 70% of them, when they get to their end of life, are going to get recycled, 
then we're still achieving the same effect. Because remember that as long as the plastics is in use, as long as it hasn't yet to got to end of use, that's a perfectly effective carbon store. Right? When you build up your stock and you're still using it, uh, in, in, that is still a carbon store. So we are very confident that recycling can go even further than Peter suggests. He has a reasonably radical scenario, but we think we can go much radical uh, further. And we believe that at least in principle, the average cost of recycling will be a relatively cheap form of carbon reduction. Costs of maybe just 35 or $40 per tonne of CO2 saved on average, which is likely to be cheaper than what we do in the production decarbonization side. Third point, and it's a point Peter has already <coughs> said, yes, in this area, carbon capture and storage will play a role. We can reduce that role by recycling, but we think it will still say a role, and indeed our overall theory about carbon capture and storage is that it is going to play a much smaller role in the power sector than people used to think 10 years ago, because renewables are going to get so much cheaper that renewables is going to be a cheaper way of decarbonizing power than putting CCS on the back of a coal-fired or a gas-fired power station. But we think CCS will play a crucial role in some industrial uh, applications, and plastics uh, is uh, one of those. Now, it may be that there are alternatives to CCS for decarbonizing the production process. There is, we believe, a possibility of using electricity for the heat input to um, the, 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 the cracking uh, furnaces, even if you still got process emissions. And there may be m ways of more deeply electrifying uh, the process uh, of uh, producing plastics, uh, though as Peter's report turns out, some of those which involve going through an intermediate step of methanol are, are quite energy intensive and the cost may uh, go against them. So there is, therefore, we believe, a major role is for CCS, though also a probable, also a role for uh, a, a, a electricity. Two final points. There is probably also a significant role, once we have done some CCS on fossil fuels, once we've done recycling uh, as the main way forward for biomass, though Peter's report is quite careful to say, and right to say, don't think about biomass as being a feasible answer to the vast majority of plastics decarbonization, because if you try to make it a large proportion of the answer, you will require biomass volumes and a volume which really strain sustainable limited literature. And finally, don't completely exclude, this is my fifth point, we mustn't completely exclude the possibility of a role of storage of plastics at end of life. The idea of storing plastics at end of life has had a very bad reputation because of landfill sites in which uncleaned plastics along with you know, nappies and all sorts of other stuff is thrown together in a badly managed space which has all sorts of leaching uh, into the, stall, uh, into the, uh, into the uh, soil. But, or runs off into rivers, etc. But if you took end-of-life plastics and you really cleaned them and shred them and put them in completely darkened rooms where there was no sunlight and there was no water, in 300 years' time, they would still, broadly speaking, be those plastics. Plastics themselves, provided we store them in the correct fashion, could be a form of carbon capture uh, and storage. And we shouldn't completely knock that. We should be open-minded about that relative to the other ways in which we can take uh, the CO2 out of plastics production. But we are absolutely confident, as I said, uh, it says it on the label, uh, that this is mission possible and that there is a route to plastics, as with all the other sectors, by 2060 to be continuing to use plastics for all the very important ways that Peter uh, a, a talked about, which add value to human life, but while producing zero emissions. And we mean zero emissions. 
not the plastic sector buying a bit of you know, tree planting elsewhere and claiming it's zero emissions, but a total zero emission process of producing and uh, using plastics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Turner. This was really thought-provoking, and I think there's a lot of very insightful messages that have come through. Uh, may I request Mr. Nikhil Deshpande, Senior Vice President, Reliance Industries, to for his comments. Thank you. Good morning. I think that was uh, a very insightful and thought-provoking, uh, you know, uh, presentation by Lord Turner. Thanks for that. I'm going to be quick in the interest of time uh, and get straight to the point. I think a lot of different perspectives uh, have been presented since morning, and I would really like to thank, uh, you know, Secretary Rao, you know, for his continuous support to basically, you know, work around this issue uh, of sustainability in petrochemicals and chemicals. Um, fundamentally, I think uh, the petrochemical industry is all set to grow, as was presented by, uh, you know, eminent panelists. But that said, I think the onus lies on all of us to basically create a more sustainable business from the petrochemical sector. And that's, I think, precisely what the theme says, you know, it's act for earth. So I think uh, we as a sector and we as producers of petrochemicals are responsible to make that happen. I don't have to repeat this. Uh, India is at an inflection point right now. And, you know, what took us 60 years to reach the first trillion, uh, you know, in nominal GDP, is probably just going to take us five years, you know, to reach the three, three trillion dollar mark of nominal GDP. Which means that we are going to use even more materials as we grow. And that's not only plastics. Plastics, of course, is going to be a very important component of that growth story. But it's going to be across multiple sectors. And there's going to be a lot of consumption of basic materials, so steel, uh, cement, plastics, aluminum, you know, everything. So I'm basically going to be touching upon you know, the, the aspect of circular economy. So circular economy expands beyond plain recycling. So circular economy basically is a way of life. That's how I like to put it. It's, it should be a way of life. And I think the world over, if you basically go back 100 years, if you go back 200 years, you know, everyone's, in a way, been practicing the concept of circular economy. So you consume less, you reuse more, and you recycle. Right? So even in the modern day world, you know, and, and when we talk about petrochemicals, circular economy is nothing but keeping your resources in circulation for a longer period of time. It's not the take, make, dispose model. It's basically you, you produce it, you reuse it, you refurbish it, you recover it, you recycle it, and then you use it again. And fundamentally, I think, as responsible members of the civic society, <coughs> you know, we basically need to, again, get away from the throwaway culture, and we need to ensure that you know, we become more responsible in terms of the reuse of all the materials you know, that are used in our day-to-day -day life. 
So in a way, circular economy is restorative and regenerative by design. And recycling is going to be a part of it. Circular economy basically has many, many moving parts, right? It's a complete ecosystem that when it comes together, it's probably going to lead to a 53% reduction in CO2 emissions. Yeah. yeah. We said 56, so. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing. So that's it. Look at, look at the sheer numbers. So again, uh, <laughs> plastics is too valuable to destroy. You know, you, you, can't, <coughs> you, can't, you can't destroy oil. And we have to extract maximum value out of this very, very valuable material. And as I said, you know, you need to create a platform to make it happen. It's got to be an ecosystem to make it happen. Now, some mind-boggling numbers by McKinsey, you know, they suggest that 220 million metric tons per annum could be recycled by the year 2030. 220 million metric tons. That's five times of what we're doing today globally. Of course, the Indian society and, and Indian plastics, waste plastics sector has been more proactive and we've actually got an informal system that's already existing. And we recycle about, you know, 80% of PET and we recycle about 58% of, of polyolefins. But of course, the recycled product is made into something that, you know, is, is used as secondary and probably cannot be really used, you know, for the core applications today, today. But we've got a collection and a segregation system in place, which is quite informal and which basically needs to be taken to a completely new level. The Ellen MacArthur report again says that the Indian economy has the potential to become, I mean, the circular economy in India has the potential to become a $230 billion industry by the year 2030, $230 billion. And I can safely assume that about 15% from that is going to be plastics. So if you take 15%, that basically translates into, you know, a minimum 30 to $35 billion worth of economy, which has the potential to employ literally millions of people, and which basically has the potential to just drop your carbon footprint by X. I don't have the number, but that's basically what the focus will be. And... Um, to achieve this circular business model, we have to ensure that, you know, we, we have new business models, we have innovation. So basically, policy stakeholders, you know, visionary government leaders, and we are lucky to have one uh, sitting with us today, and the industry, they need to basically work together and ensure that this is achieved. Because if all the stakeholders are not involved, and if, even if one stakeholder basically decides to not cooperate, then, you know, the ecosystem probably is not going to be as perfect. It's going to probably create some flaws uh, in, you know, in the process to, to achieve the circularity of, uh, of, of the sector. So I think we need champions. And I'm assuming that all the people sitting in this room are champions. I mean, I'm a champion. And, you know, unless and until we really develop that passion and unless and until every single organization in the ecosystem, starting with the petrochemical manufacturers and probably ending with the consumers, don't commit to champion this, you know, it's probably very difficult to implement it at a ground level. But I'm sure that it's all going to change and the next 10 years is basically going to see a lot of creative disruption which is basically going to change everything for the better, especially plastics. So as I said, you know, innovative approach is the need of the hour. And uh, fundamentally, I think as Lord Turner said, plastics, you know, is too valuable a material to destroy. So theoretically, zero tons of plastics should be going to landfill. And 100% of the plastics should basically be having some applications. So incineration really is, is or should be the last option. Landfill should be the last option. So fundamentally, you need to create ample number of open loop and closed loop solutions. When I talk about closed loop solutions, I'm, I'm talking about recycling. And when I talk about open loop, it's more like end of life solutions, where you basically uh, ensure that you extract value out of this very valuable material. 
So as I said, new innovative and systematic approach is really required to, to make this happen at every level of the ecosystem. Just some statistics. This is India, basically. So approximately, we consume about 14 million metric tons of polymers, PET included. About 5 million metric tons is recycled. Um, but that's going to change by 2030. Our estimates are that uh, 14 million metric tons is going to be recycled. That's three times. And that's, it could be four times if we were to go by Lord Turner's numbers, you know, that only 30% would be, would be virgin. So, so just imagine the kind of movement that we will be required to start starting tomorrow, or which has already started, I should say, to, to make this happen by 2030. And just imagine the kind of positive impact that it will have uh, on the entire ecosystem. And no doubt, this is going to be, com be competing with Virgin. So, so very quickly, this is basically you know the Indian scenario: recycled uh, polyolefins. You know, a lot of, a uh, uh, lot of you know informal recycled materials are produced from this. And uh, I'm very proud to say that the person who's actually done a fantastic sort of research for us, uh, a CPMA member. You know, all three of them are sitting in this room. Thank you. Uday, Dave, and uh, Mahinder, thank you for actually doing this. So, so in a way, you know, the CPMA has the exact statistics on 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 what's really happening in the in the recycle market. Petrochemicals is a very important, um, you know, aspect of the whole value chain, and and the petrochemical majors basically have to take the lead in this, in my opinion. If you basically look at what's happening globally and what's happened over the last six months, a number of mid-level deals are happening. I mean, very large deals are not happening, but a number of mid-level deals are happening. Lionel Bezel and Suez basically have formed a JV to recycle polyolefins. The concept is very clear, you know, Suez is a global leader in resource management, in waste collection, and even in recycling. But as Lionel Bezel is one of the world's best known petrochemical organizations. So they've decided to join hands and basically take recycling to a completely new level. Similarly, Unilever, you know, when it comes to innovation, when it comes to technology, the industry has to step in. The government has to step in. The, 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 the academy has to step in. And basically, this innovation has to be nurtured because, again, innovative technology, groundbreaking technology is going to be a very, very important aspect to make circular economy, you know, for plastics uh, successful. Extremely important. Sabic and uh, Plastics Energy have built a chemical recycling plant, and what I get to hear is uh, they're going to be making industry-grade fuel uh, out of this, and they're going to be transferring it back as feedstock into the steam cracker. So um, I'll probably get details, uh, you know, in a few days from now. Burialis, again, a leading petrochemical manufacturer, big time uh, getting into recycling and, and big time getting into circular economy. So, I mean, I can, I can name a number of companies who are doing it today and, and really getting in the thick of things. I'm very proud to say that, of course, uh, my company, Reliance Industries, we recycle about two and a half billion PET bottles every year to make about 33 kT of staple fiber, which is basically what is used and what we are wearing today. We call it green gold. But we, we took the lead uh, about 20 years back and we are completely committed to you know this uh, aspect of coming up with you know green products in the future. Just a, a quick optic here. So be prepared. Petrochemical makers have to I mean, manufacturers have to be prepared because the leading brands now are being pressurized by the board to start using recycle product in every single packaging material that you're using. So the target now is 25% packaging material should be uh, using, I mean, 25% recycled material should be used in all of the packaging that they're using. And probably by 2040, there are many companies who have taken the pledge that, you know, 100% packaging material can be reused or recycled. This also means that you need to change the very structure of the material that's being used. 
This may call for a renewed initiative on sustainable packaging. Sustainable packaging is something which can be easily recycled. So there's going to be a renewed. EPR, of course, has already been covered a very important, a very important um, uh, aspect. Without EPR, it's going to be very difficult to make uh, collection Pandey, could possible. We yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so to just sum it up, the petrochemicals industry can help solve the plastics waste problem, you know, by basically ensuring that the policymakers, the plastic supply chain, the consumers, waste managers, and the OEMs and the plastic processors come together to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I request Mr. Devore, Director, Bureau of Energy Efficiency? Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Thank you, sir. Thank. <coughs> First of all, I thanks the Terry for inviting Bureau of Energy Efficiency and asking us to talk on the one of the solution for sustainability into the petrochemical sector. Since morning, we heard about lot the need of the sustainability and the uh, reduction of footprints, carbon footprints into the petrochemical sector. Sir, I want to talk on a little bit on the Perform Achieve and Trade program, which was initiated by Government of India for bringing the energy efficiencies into the industrial sectors. So before moving, I will just introduce that the Bureau of Energy Efficiency is a statutory body which forms under the Energy Conservation Act and its main mandate is to promote the energy efficiency in all the sectors of the economy. Under the Paris Agreement, there are two important areas where we are going to achieve this, our commitments. One is the significant, that is, energy efficiency. The uh, significant potent, uh, portion of this target is going to be made by energy efficiency only, apart from renewables. So PAD is very important component of NDCs, which is being committed by Government of India in Paris Agreement. I will just skip this one uh, the briefly. I think many people may be aware about it. It's a regulatory program initiated for reducing the specific energy consumption in energy intensive industries, which have a market based mechanism. This is the first scheme in the world where the energy efficiency certificates are being traded into the market and it is being given as incentives to the industries for bringing more energy efficiency into, the, into their processes and the production process systems. So it has been devised based on the some provisions under the Energy Conservation Act. It is a part of the National Action Plan on Climate Change. It is a having important role into the NDCs. I will just skip all this. This is and directly come to the this is the implementation mechanism of this PAT program. Right now we have covered more than 11 sectors. There are four cycles of this PAT scheme has been already uh, means notified. First cycle was completed and three are in under process. We included petroleum refineries, railways, discoms, petrochemicals and the buildings in the last two cycles. I will come back on this slides. But before that, I will just move to the inclusion of petrochemical sectors. So, sir, apart from refineries, as the parliament questions you are talking in the morning, what government has taken initiatives to reduce the 
the growing demand of the oil and also the petrochemicals so, so one one of these initiative is also being the answer to that the question the refineries has been included into the pad scheme where the targets has been given to them to reduce their specific energy consumption and if they achieve the more than the target they will get the energy efficient certificate which they can trade with the other industries and if they are not able to achieve it then they have to buy it or otherwise pay penalty to the government so in this market mechanism we learn that most of the refineries are implemented lot of energy efficiency initiatives and achieving the uh, process efficiencies very highly so sir these are the numbers which we talked in the mor morning also means the demand of the petrochemicals how is going to be increased in india which is double in the, by 2030 and even the per capita consumption right now if you can see the data is currently very low with respect to the our gdp but if you are going to achieve at least world average that is 32 <coughs> kgs per capita by 2040 still the required petrochemicals demand is very high so in the first phase we target only the crackers units and all these eight crackers has been given a target to achieve the energy efficiencies so all these eight crackers four are from reliance one is from iocl hpcl gale and bpcl so all these mixed gas and naphtha crackers they have given a target to reduce their specific energy consumption and around we hope that six percent <coughs> energy consumption can be reduced in the morning you said that around two percent one to two percent of this feed stock is being used as a fuel into the petrochemicals so out of this two percent we are sh damn sure in the cycle when we will achieve more than the six percent with this tool with this scheme so the areas for energy efficiency into the process is first particularly they can improve the processes by housekeeping operating properly with uh, uh, with advanced control systems they can improve the control system with tot and all other things they can do modifications that is replacement of inefficient inefficient technologies with efficient one and then integration that is like similar pinch technologies which can be used to internal energy uh, use of internal energy resources within the processes and the subsequent phase sir, we are going to cover all other petrochemicals and even the plastic industries into the pad scheme so that they get the incentives and they can uh, achieve the energy efficiency into the processes sir i'm happy to share here with you the results of the pat one scheme which is already measured this is the first scheme in in the world sir where all the energy savings has been measured monitored and certified so i'm really happy to share that in the in cycle one we saved around 8.67 million tons of oil equivalent which is equivalent to 1.25 percent of the india's total primary energy supply and the emissions which we reduce through this cycle one is around more than 31 million tons of co2 sir which is around two percent of the india's total emissions and sir this is not only the uh, the uh, emission reductions and the energy saving program it is also the skill development means a lot of employment has been generated through this program means more than 5000 engineers and operators has been trained we created the professionals energy auditors and energy managers more than 13000 people are being energy auditors and manager who got the business who got the employment into this sector the savings sir monetary saving we achieved around 37000 crore rupees which is equivalent to 5.8 billion usd sir and the investment which has been made by all these industries of eight sectors in this cycle one that is 478 industries is around 24,000 crore rupees which is equivalent to 3.8 billion USD sir and now cycle two is also complete uh, on the verge to complete means this is the target year next year we are going to monitor and verify and these are our estimates the, the cycle two will also have a very good results it's not cumulative no? it's not cumulative sir so so total sir <coughs> 
in the cycle four where we included the petrochemical sector, their consumption of these eight plants is around 3.8 million tons of oil equivalent. And we are going to, at least minimum, we are going to save 0.22 million tons of oil equivalent from this sector alone. So, uh, so this is the one of the very important program which uh, bringing incentives to the industries for energy efficiency. I'm also happy to share that before PAT, our cement sector was not a globally a best energy efficient sector, but after implementing this program, the cement sector is now globally most energy efficient system, uh, sorry, energy efficiency sector. And now fertilizer is also a second best and very soon they will also be a best one. Refineries are also, our refineries are also very energy efficient compared to all other refineries. And we hope that with this tool, our petrochemical sector, we will also bring more efficiencies and make it world best energy efficiency sector. So with this, I have a little information about the topic, but for energy efficiency, definitely government has taken a very good initiative and it will uh, help the petrochemical sector for achieving the sustainability. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's, it's uh, heartening that we are pioneers in this market mechanism on energy efficiency and results are truly impressive. Uh, Mr. Agarwal of the Plastic Cement Association. I don't I have no, no presentation. Just close this. Good afternoon, everybody. I have no power presentation ready and because I have all the details with me here which I want to share with you. I belong to an association of small scale manufacturers, almost 35 year old and the challenges that we face while collecting the plastic waste. Recycling is a wonderful alternative. It is the, one of the roads to reducing carbon in the earth, decarbonizing the economy as Lord Turner said. But the challenges that we face during this uh, recycling, I'll share with you my personal experiences over the past 30, 35 years in this. Recycling involves the only thing that is the bane in the whole chain is collection. We cannot, if we collect the plastic that we use, then there are many solutions available. The problem is, that we cannot at our level, I'm talking basically about India, sir, that even segregating wet and dry waste is a challenge. I worked in villages, I worked in municipalities, I worked in cities. Segregating wet and dry is a challenge. And then further segregating the dry waste into plastic and other recyclable material is a further challenge. And unless we counter this at the first step, we have been trying segregating wet and dry, which we have succeeded to a large extent. And then segregating plastic out of it is a big challenge. Good plastic, let me say recycled plastic, I'm not talking about the waste which industries generate because they are very clever. They generate because the plastic waste is not dirty. They recycle and reuse. That's so simple. Now, taking it out of the municipal solid waste stream is a big challenge as figures that I have is about 10% in generally plastic is about 10% of the municipal solid waste until it reaches the landfill it, it's about 5%, 4 to 5% which goes to the landfill. Now this challenging task of taking plastic out of the municipal solid waste, if this can be done then the problem is sorted to a large extent and we have been attempting, we have given different bags for collecting plastic but then good plastic is scavenged at multiple levels even after collection from the household. Pet bottles are now no, nowhere to be seen at the landfill, nor is good plastic. It is not there at all. Now, taking this 5% out of uh, the municipal solid waste from the landfill level, it is very difficult. It is very difficult. And once we are successful in eliminating this, 
now start at the grassroot grassroot level we have been saying that treat your plastic waste with respect i have just eaten the toffee and it's bad to throw the wrapper i'm enjoying the toffee why not bin this wrapper right i've just eaten the burger or the ice cream or the chips packet i'm enjoying that to so why throw it why litter it why is it necessary to litter i mean these are the basic messages if we we have to start from here to reach at the top level everyone knows the solutions once this plastic is collected there are many solutions it could be uh, used in cement kilns it could be used for building roads it could be in, fa in fact i would like to ask lord turner and levy sir is pyrolysis a substitute for extracting oil out of the mixed plastic rather than uh, attempting to store the used plastic why should not attempt to have the oil back i we have we are at present in a uh, mou signing an mou with a company for a pyrolysis two tons per day plant which they say does will not release any noxious fumes in the air and once this mixed plastic is ready for extraction of oil there is no need to ex segregate it further into let's say pet ldp pp etc this mixed plastic except pvc that's what they say is good enough for extracting oil which is a light diesel oil type and could be used so this back to cradle to grave and back to cradle story could be worked we we, we hope this plant will be functionable in the next about 6 months 4 to 6 months i think one issue if this is done i will not mind repeating again collection is the only thing that has to be done for solving our problem if we can collect it and collection is the joint responsibility not only of the corporations of the government bodies of the ulbs or our local bodies of the government it is everyone's responsibility it is everyone's responsibility next the quality of recycling has to improve once we insist on recycling in the traditional way whatever mixed etc it would go black and black as lot turn rightly said you know we don't want that the quality of recycling has to go up as far as color segregation is already cheaply available in our country you can segregate color wise blue red white there are machines now very cheap available we have we have four such machines in delhi sir we can segregate blue in one not in one go because that's a very expensive machine it's a cheap machine one color at one time we segregate and they use it i mean this is this is being done and this is what we should do because if we improve the quality of recycling all the persons who have said they have a target of uti utilizing 100% 50% they will meet their target only if the quality of recycled material is good if we go on mixing if we don't improve the quality of recycling then things again come to a stall they again stop we have to improve the quality of recycling and next step is we will involve our bureau of indian standards to make it mandatory to use a specific percentage in their final product it is not there i am a member of the bis also we now promulgate this once the quality of recycling goes up then we can promulgate this also that this 20% 5% 10% should be used or to start with and it should be marked on the product this has 10% or 20% recycled material just like many international companies have said that by a particular year they will use 100% recycled material in india unless we improve the quality of recycling this will be a far goal you know we, we may not be able to achieve it the purpose of associations or perhaps small scale manufacturers like us we are also part of society or perhaps everyone sitting in the room is that if we should attempt and help the ulbs to segregate the plastic out of the msw municipal solid waste stream <coughs> unless this is done it will be a difficult problem next sir i have heard um, we have in fact i had talk with a company lanza technologies usa they will be treating i had an occasion to meet the ceo of that company about 6 months back when she was in india at the shiram institute lecture now 
taking this MSW route, because there is no dearth of MSW in India, via methane to plastic, I think this seems to me to be the best alternative route. Why oil? Why, why not this route? Forget the cost of the technology at present. Naturally, as time passes, the cost of technology goes down. But if you can take extract methane, which is being done out of the MSW, or perhaps um, biological rubbish or whatever, then methane route to plastic is a viability. Indian oil company IOC has already gone ahead with a small MOU, small plant, sir. Is this not a viable route, sir? These are certain questions, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Agarwal. Uh, we are a little short of time, but I think we can take a couple, few questions or comments from the audience. Please, please introduce yourself also. And then uh, there'll, be, there'll be opportunities for leadership uh, globally in, in whatever is implemented successfully. What is, what is the government's plans to launch India as a, uh, as, as a leader in, in sustainability in petrochemicals? <coughs> Lord Turner, would you like to respond first? And well, uh, <coughs> as I think our, our colleague from Reliance Industry said, the recycling industry, plastics recycling industry, in all its aspects, is going to be an enormous industry with lots of different characteristics, lots of technologies, sorting technologies, the sort of you know, color-specific sorting we've just been talking about, with chemical recycling, uh, which is some, you know, a, a, a very different type of, of, of process, but where there are a whole series of technological developments. So I think the crucial thing for the government to do is to set very stretching regulatory targets which try to lean against uh, you know throwing away uh, plastics uh, I was just actually thinking before you talked about what would be the single most important policy lever I would love to have across the world I'd love a tax on oil on feedstocks into primary uh, plastics production I mean, if we put a tax on feedstocks into primary plastic production, there would be then enormous incentives for people to work out how to not have naphtha or ethane going into primary plastics production, but to be used being recycled. You know, taxes are very, very powerful things. And I think they're particularly powerful in this area where there's such a complex set of multiple different routes that we could use that you need the power of the price mechanism uh, to shift the incentive. <coughs> so I would certainly think about that as a policy tool. See, uh, <clears throat> as I was mentioning in the beginning itself, that uh, the government is very keen that uh, uh, the, the recycling aspects, uh, reuse and reduce, these all these aspects are given enough importance. and. Uh, uh, we are having series of uh, uh, meetings and discussions as to how to translate all these things into actionable points. So uh, one of the things uh, he has rightly mentioned, Turner has rightly mentioned about the taxation, that that could be one of the options. But, mm -hmm. but I would be uh, extremely happy if the industry or the, the eminent people like you could give us uh, your uh, choices or your suggestions along with... Uh, specific uh, benefits that are likely to accrue with each of them, that, so that that could be a starting point for discussion on this. But we are all very keen on uh, reducing, reusing, and recycling the waste products. Yeah, thank you. Any other? Uh, yeah, I'm Pradip Tukhosh from Terry, and this is actually uh, a few comments and maybe one, maybe one question. So the question really is to Peter, and that is that, you know, from Ravi Agarwal's presentation, I mean, and it's very clear that the main problem of 
recyclability arises in the single use plastics which are primarily used for packaging and the challenge really is to make that category of polymers biodegradable now there are some technologies they are available in india where they use uh, carbohydrate as feedstock but it is expensive it is biodegradable and so the question is that you know what is there globally r and d happening into into this area because this problem of the last mile collection problem that mr ravi agarwal has mentioned it is something which is very very difficult to solve if this cannot be solved at the very low uh, labor rates in india it cannot be solved anywhere in the world now for a couple of a couple of comments one is that uh, i think lord turner was a little pessimistic about the scope for use of biomass uh, in yeah. you know, essentially he was concerned about the volumes but the point is that we have done some work in terry and you know the crop biomass that we generate each year is more than 500 million tons of coal equivalent which is way more than our total consumption of pet of petroleum natural gas and oil put together and of course this creates a huge problem partly responsible it's partly responsible for the air pollution problems that we that we have yeah. all over north india so i wouldn't be that pessimistic a second uh, comment is that in the bush era there was a proposal for using part of the energy content of hydrocarbons to split a larger volume of hydrocarbons into elemental carbon and hydrogen and then of course the hydrogen could be used for the various purposes that lord turner mentioned and of course the elemental carbon there is a research challenge but the point is that elemental carbon itself you know can be a feedstock for you know for many different kinds of you know materials industries now this proposal which made perfectly good sense you know to chemical engineers uh has not been followed up i mean i wonder why if 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 mr if if uh, peter can give some insights to that uh my final comment to uh, to lord turner is that he seemed to suggest that the electrolytic route for ammonia is new but in fact in india oh, no, no, no. no it's not it's not because i know that there is a plant in india in, in nangal which i've had the yeah. good fortune to visit yeah. which is a very large yeah. you know uh, 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 you know uh, ammonia uh, um, uh, you know ammonia fertilizer plant which has been operating on the electrolytic electrolytic route yeah. for more than 60 years yeah. okay so it's, it's not new absolutely first yeah i'm sure i will i'll i'll try and move briskly but i'm um, for sure follow up with me if you would like uh, any more information on any of my responses but to take your first point about biodegradable plastics um for sure there's some promising uh, moves been made here on the technological front if you uh, look at there's a there's a trade association for biodegradable plastics or bioplastics in general those made from biomass feedstocks and those that are subsequently biodegradable um and there are there's a lot of progress happening in this area there's a lot of different streams of plastic that are different streams of polymers that are being developed um and these are build the capacity additions in these fields are are quite um quite rapid of in recent years there are some problems um the mixture of some of these biodegradable plastics with conventional plastics can then limit the ex or can have all of the cause some of the separation problems that were being talked about previously um a a biodegradable strain of the same polymer can sometimes contain a, an additive that is then pollutes the recycling stream for another virgin produced polymer so there are some complications there are also the difficulties that when uh when certain some of these polymers biodegrade i mean the co2 emission yeah. is it takes place anyway so it's 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 by well if it, if it's by mass if it's by, if it's by mass feed stock then it's it's <laughs> neutral then that links to the to the second uh, aspect of or the second question you raised um the uh, availability of biomass and the expense which we saw in our analysis that it takes to produce these in certain regions in the world we see uh, bioenergy uh, based plastics particularly dehydration ethanol dehydration to produce ethylene as a uh, promising route partly because of availability in some regions uh, india Brazil are two a key countries but also because of the selectivity to ethylene that you get from ethanol which is very high which makes it a, an attractive route even in our baseline scenario um 
when you get to the gasification of biomass to produce elemental hydrogen and then give you the flexibility to produce the full range of primary chemicals, we see these routes as much less techno-economically attractive based on the information we've been able to gather. The, the inefficiency you incur when you gasify biomass is high. The capex of the plants for ammonia and methanol are high. Um, and this leads it to be less attractive than uh, either water electrolysis or equipping traditional routes with, um, uh, with carbon capture. So th that, that was the conclusion that we came to in our, in our analyses. Um, and then last point on the elemental carbon uh, generation through uh, me either methane splitting or as a byproduct in, in uh, uh, I think you were referring to uh, boosting the yield of hydrogen as a byproduct of chemical production. This was a specific proposal in the bush era. To use uh, the to process split energy. hydrocarbons yep. using a small part of the hydrocarbon stream. Yep. The energy of the, uh, to split that and to get elemental <coughs> hydrogen and elemental carbon. Okay. And then, of course, the hi hydrogen could be used for all the purposes that Lord Turner may mentioned. And the elemental carbon had potential use, you know, because it's, uh, you know, it, it, can be, it can be, you know, yep. uh, used in many, many different ways. Absolutely. So, I, I mean, carbon black is one of the yeah, key um, areas of uh, elemental carbon usage. I mean, it's the key form in which yeah. carbon is used elementally. It's about 12, 13 million tons a, a year, I, rec I, I, I remember. That might be a slightly outdated figure. Uh, so it's a relatively small amount of carbon that we actually use elementally in, in producing things like tires and pigments and inks and so on. Um, there are proposals to, to use the process of methane splitting where you split the carbon from the hydrogen, cleave it from the, from the hydrogen uh, and get both. Uh, and these uh, processes with uh, no oxidation of the carbon are, uh, have promise from their kind of mitigation uh, potential. We, we haven't seen these deployed at scale yet in our research. Um, the current method of producing elemental carbon for carbon black, uh, furnace black processes, um, these, these processes are, are very polluting. Um, Byproduct hydrogen from steam crackers, which is a substantial quantity that's produced each year in above 10 million tons, I think uh, is, is uh, I, I think is a, a ballpark. Um, this is a potentially very valuable resource, but it is already, to a large extent, we believe, being utilized. So it's uh, either small amounts are uh, fed into process energy streams. Um, some of it is used in refineries and adjacent refining sites to in uh, various hydro-treating and other hydrogen-consuming processes. Um, and then there's also the use of hydrogen on, in the chemical site to hydrogenate other components <coughs> of the the pyrolysis gathering stream and other streams that are coming out of the steam crackers. So although this is a very uh, valuable resource, we, we uh, estimate that it is already being fairly well utilized and tapped. So yeah, sorry, I don't want to take any longer to respond because other panelists uh, would probably like to say something. It, very briefly, I mean, on the bioplastics, people talk, and, and, and Peter's report, report is, has a very good map on this, People talk about making plastics from biomass and making plastics biodegradable. Now, if it's both, if they're <coughs> made from biomass and they're biodegradable, that's fine because it's a zero carbon cycle. The one thing which would be a bad development from the climate point of view, but is a possible technological development, is to make plastics from fossil fuels which are biodegradable. Uh, and let me, you've got, you've got to be clear, that will put CO2 uh, into the atmosphere just the same as burning the fossil fuels. So as long as they're biomass and biodegradable, they're a contribution. Total biomass resources. The challenge with total biomass resources is that a lot of calculations out there say, look, there's all this biomass resource, and then the plastics industry says, well, I'd like that, and the aviation industry says, I'd like that, and the shipping industry says, I'd like that, or the trucking industry says, I'd like that. What we tried to do in our report is to try and have a vision of how much sustainable biomass could the world produce. The IEA has a figure of 140 exajoules. Other people like World Resources Institute wouldn't go above 50 exajoules. We played around with a figure of 70 exajoules. And then say, let's look at all of the demands that different sectors could place on that. And let's think about a budget where you'd want to use that for where there really aren't alternative ways of decarbonizing. So actually, I would say one of the highest priority uses of a limited supply of sustainable <coughs> biomass is 
aviation jet fuel, because I'm not sure there are any other ways to get planes to fly from London to New Delhi that, except by creating a biofuel equivalent of, of jet fuel. Um, whereas I think there are other sectors of the economy where we have alternatives. So I'm sure if we look at the, the, the total amount in total would be sufficient to do uh, 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 the plastics, but we've got to compare it with all the other claims that other sectors would like to make on a limited sustainable biomass resource. And then the final point, you're absolutely right about electrolysis. In 1950, almost all the uh, N urea fertilizer in the world was made in Norway with hydrogen, which was produced by electrolysis. What happened subsequently is that natural gas was discovered in such large quantities and was so cheap that using steam methane reforming became a cheaper way of producing hydrogen than it had be previously been produced. But there's absolutely nothing new about this technology. Indeed, the fundamental technology of electrolysis is probably something that every one of us may have done as a kid, where you take two wires and put them into a glass of water, uh, put an electric current on, and oxygen comes off one and hydrogen comes across the other. It's, it's very straightforward, it's very uh, elementary science. Uh, the challenge is to get the cost down, which is all about the design of the anodes and the cathodes uh, and, and the precise uh, balance of the system, but I think we should be very confident that we can do that. But you're absolutely right, the technology in itself you know, was there before we had steam methane reforming as an alternative route to produce hydrogen. Uh, to end, I'd like to thank all our panelists. I think it's been a very thought-provoking discussion. And uh, what is encouraging from India's perspective is that we are uh, moving quite well in recycling as well as in energy efficiency. And you've left us enough food for thought on what are the other things we should think about and try and do. Thank you.